Again, thank you for joining us for another APH Academy. So before we get started, I'd like to review our learning objectives for today. We're going to be covering a lot of content, but our hope is that everyone will be able to follow along and take away at least minimally our three learning objectives, which would be for our participants to be able to demonstrate the use of six key entry mode in the Braille Blaster version two, that you will be able to describe at least three differences between Braille Blaster version one and the previous version, version one, two, our new version <laughs> of version one, sorry. Um, and lastly, we hope that you will be able to identify three supported file types that are supported by Braille Blaster version two. Um, as far as materials for today, if you had the opportunity to install Braille Blaster version two on your computer, that is wonderful. Um, but if not, that's all right too. We have plenty of opportunity to interact and ask questions. So um, I'd like to go ahead at this time to turn it over to our instructor for today, William Freeman. Hey, William. All right, great. Thanks for that, Jeff. And thanks for, thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, we're really excited about this webinar. Uh, Braille Blaster version two is something we've been working on for quite a long time. Um, and really it was a refocusing of Braille Blaster. When we first put out Braille Blaster, our goal was to make a Braille transcription program to get Braille into the hands of uh, students faster. And we've done that, but it wasn't in the way we expected. So our, our primary audience was transcribers. And we made this complicated program uh, with transcribers as the end user. And then what we found is that the majority of our users were uh, teachers. The majority of our users are teachers, paraprofessionals, uh, and that's the, you know, the majority of folks that are attending this webinar today. And so that's continuing to be proven out. Um, so what, what we wanted to do with version two was really refocus the program on what would benefit teachers uh, and paraprofessionals the most in their everyday work. And so the majority of this webinar is going to be me using Braille Blaster and showing, showing you all you know, what you can do and how you can do it. And for those that have used it before, you know, some of this may be redundant, but with such a large portion of the audience having never used Braille Blaster before, I really have to just go back to the basics. And so let's start, I'm gonna share my screen and let's start by talking about the website. So we'll just start really quickly with the most basic of tasks, which is the Braille Blaster website. So I'm sharing my screen now, and I'm gonna be describing uh, everything that I'm doing and, and what I've got going on here. And if you have any questions in the chat, uh, please feel free to throw them in the chat. If, if you ask something that I'm already planning on covering, you know, I'm not necessarily you know, gonna respond, uh, but please don't don't feel like I'm ignoring you, but I definitely want to see your questions. Uh, maybe you're going to ask something that I wasn't going to cover, and I can go ahead and cover that. Or especially if I'm covering something currently and you're confused, you're like, wait, I don't get this. What are you talking about? Uh, go ahead and say it. You're not going to embarrass me. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the chance to go ahead and clarify what it was I was trying to, to get across. So I do have the chat open, and so please feel free to, to send your questions in the chat as we proceed today. So right now I'm at BrailleBlaster.org. The most important part of BrailleBlaster.org is the download page. So we've got a download link. It's right there in two places on the, uh, the landing page. And when you get there, I've been here before, so it's not asking me for my email, but if you've never been here before, it's gonna ask you for your email address. That email address is just for um, reporting to the Department of Education because we have to report everything we do basically to the Department of Ed. And so that email address is, so when we make that report, we can say we've got this many users and we do sometimes use the at part. So if you've got at aph.org, we know you work at APH. If you've got at some school.edu, we know you work at a school. So it helps us tell who's, who's using the program when we make those reports um, to the Department of Education. But when you download it, there's two tracks. There's the stable track and there's the beta track. The beta track has been tested and we've deemed it good enough to put out, uh, but it's gonna be the earliest, latest version. Right now, the stable and the beta are the same, but sometimes the beta is a little bit ahead. Um, but this, it's available for Windows, 
Mac, Linux, and then we have a universal zip. So the Windows, Mac, and Linux, those are all pretty self-explanatory, I think. You know, you'll download the one that you need, whether you're on a Windows machine, a Mac, or if you're one of the like half a dozen people that use Linux. I'm just kidding. Lots of people use Linux. Um, the universal zip is neat because if you're in a school or if you're if you work at APH, if you work at APH, you can't install whatever you want necessarily. You know, you've got you've got your tech people, you know, protecting you from installing things that might be bad. Um, so what you can do is you can download this universal zip and then you just download it, you unzip it, and then you can run Braille Blaster from that zip. So you don't have to install it. You don't have to get your IT person involved. Uh, it allows you to stay up to date on the latest and greatest because whenever the latest comes out, you go ahead and download it. And then right away, you're gonna be able to run it from that unzipped folder Make sure you delete the old one so you don't get confused. Uh, but yeah, never have to install it. Just run it from the zipped folder and you'll get all the same features and enhancements of an installed version without having to get, have the hassle of messing with uh, you know, your IT person. Um, there's also a sample NIMAS file that you can download. You have to agree not to share it uh, because these are protected and uh, the folks over at uh, Houghton Mifflin were very kind to let us post this sample NIMAS file, but that just gives you an idea of what's possible with NIMAS files. Uh, for those that haven't heard of NIMAS files before, those are a, uh, they're a special kind of XML file available through the NIMAC library, which is hosted uh, by APH. And every state in the United States has a NIMAC representative so if you need a textbook for a student, you can contact your NIMAC representative and get that NIMAS file uh, and then open it in Braille Blaster. And then we've got the link to the NIMAC uh, website here as well. One other thing, so something we're gonna cover is there are differences between version two and version one. Um, primarily, Primarily version two was a taking away. So we took away features to focus the product because you know when you support things, you've got you to make sure they work. You've got to cover them. If you add something new, you've got to make sure it works with all the old stuff and it ends up taking away from your development time. So it's primarily gonna, there are features we've taken away in version two. We've added some stuff uh, and it's great stuff and the performance is a lot better, but for those that just love version one, can't live without version one, you know, you love the T-Page generator, you love the TOC builder, uh, you love smart volumes. Uh, version one is still available on the website as a legacy download. The key thing about this legacy download is that it is not going to be updated. So it's not gonna be updated and it's not supported. It's available for those that need it, uh, and we are going to be adding more features to version two, you know, so I don't think folks are going to be relying on version one forever, but it is available for folks that just love version one. If you don't, if, if some of the words I just said, TOC builder, T-Page generator, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Those have been removed from version two as a part of our refocusing on the uh, teachers and paraprofessionals that are using Braille Blaster so much. Uh, we have some questions about international use of uh, NIMAS files. My understanding, and I know Nicole's here, uh, not to put her on the spot, so she can probably answer this better than I can through the chat, but my understanding is NIMAC files are only available in the United States. So they're only available to folks in the US, but uh, Nicole will know better than I do. So those are the downloads. I hope folks have been able to download Braille Blaster uh, to follow along today. If you were not able to download Braille Blaster, now's the perfect time. You're gonna have a little bit of time while I, I quickly go through the website here to let folks know what resources are available. Um, so go ahead and download the version you need and start installing it so that you can follow along with us today. Um, we also have frequently asked questions um, and you can, you know, it's a, a list of links and you can go ahead and click the link that most interests you. Here's a good one, how much does it cost? It's free. Uh, Braille Blaster is free. 
Uh, it's free to download, free to use. I think everyone should take advantage of it. Even if you have Duxbury or Braille 2000, you can still benefit from using Braille Blaster. I know folks, I know a production house that it's a Braille 2000 production house and they use Braille Blaster in their uh, process. They, they start the file in Braille Blaster, they take advantage of all of our tools and resources, and then they finish up in Braille 2000. And that does not offend me at all. Uh, my goal is to get more Braille in front of kids. So however we can do that, let's do it. Um, so if you've not downloaded Braille Blaster, download Braille Blaster. There's no reason not to use it. Even if you, even if you own Duxbury and Braille 2000 and Tiger Software Suite, go ahead and get Braille Blaster as well. Uh, you might as well use Braille Blaster. We've also got documentation. So one point of clarification here is we have two user guides. The first user guide is for version one. The second user guide is, it says user guide version two. That's what you're gonna want. We're eventually gonna probably pare this down and make it a little easier. But for right now, we've got user guide and user guide version two. You're gonna want user guide version two. We've also got a quick reference card that folks are able to download if they'd like, and that's got all of our hotkeys and some quick primers. Uh, that's available in both print and Braille. And then we've got a lot of videos. So we've got a ton of videos. Uh, you might recognize the person in the videos. Uh, it's me, and, and, and at least uh, most of them. And there, five of them are now, the basics videos are now all now captioned in Spanish. So they have English and Spanish captions. So, you know, download Braille Blaster, check out the documentation. Uh, we've got a place to give feedback. So, you know, if, if you just love the TOC Builder and you can't live without it, this is the place to tell us, hey, you took out the TOC Builder. Uh, I used to like you, now I don't like you. Bring the TOC Builder back, please. So I hope folks will check that out. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you'd love to see. Um, this feedback form is the perfect way to do that. This goes to the entire development team. So we'll all, you know, everybody on the development team will get your feedback and we'll be able to incorporate it into, uh, into our production cycle. All right. So that's the website, um, brailleblaster.org. Let's jump into the program. So I already have Braille Blaster open here. And I've got it set to the default behaviors. So right now it's set to the defaults. And I'm gonna walk you through a, just, just a quick description of the screen. So at the top, we've got our menu. I'm on Windows, obviously. It looks slightly different on Mac and on Linux, but I've got the menu at the top. Below that, I have the toolbar. Those that have come from V1, you'll notice there's a lot less icons on the toolbar. We really cleaned it up and focused it. And there's no need to go through each and every single icon that's there, but we'll go through as we're using the program, we'll go over what different things do and how they can be used. Then the kind of the main th point of Braille Blaster is there at the bottom of the screen. It's taking up the majority of the screen. It's the three views. So. We've got three views on the left where it says body text, that's the style view. And that's gonna show you what style the current item is. Um, oh, is it still showing uh, the yeah, feedback William. form? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I must have shared my, uh, thank you. I'm glad folks said something. I could have gone on all day. <laughs> cool, so now I'm showing Braille Blaster. Thank you. Perfect. So we've got the menu at the top, then the toolbar, and then the three views. My cursor right now is in the print view. There's no, no text there. And then the other view is the Braille view. Let's go ahead and get some text so that we're able to talk about uh, Braille Blaster. And actually, I'm gonna share my screen one more time and make sure, because it, yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and type some text. This is Braille Blaster. Uh, exclamation mark. And the text is really small. It's it's perfect, I think, for when you're working, but when you're trying to share your screen and uh, show folks what you're doing, it is not quite good enough. So I'm gonna increase the font size. And you can do that by going to uh, view, and then there's increase font size. 
And so I can do that. And then I can also use the hotkey. So the hotkey is control equal sign. And so if I just press control equal sign, that'll make the braille uh, bigger. Well, it'll make the braille and the print bigger. Should be easier for folks to, uh, to see. So one neat thing about version two is we're doing real time translation. So we're not gonna translate, we're not gonna stop and interrupt you and try to translate while you're in the middle of typing. That we found makes an awkward experience. And it also can be really taxing on a slower computer. And so what we do is you type, so I am typing some text right now. And if I keep typing, notice Braille Blaster goes ahead and pushes me to the proper line. So it's kind of translating in the background. It's not posting it right away, but it knows how to translate what you're typing. And so it knows when you get to line two, it knows to pull the, the text down to that next line. So, you know, as I was typing, if I keep, it realized that I'd reached the end of that line and then jumped me down to the next line, even though it hadn't translated yet, even though you hadn't seen it translate yet. And so it's translating in the background. You don't have to do anything. In version one, you had to press enter or move your cursor to get it to translate. Now it's going to be translating just as you're going and then updating basically whenever you pause. So whenever you stop for a second, it's going to go ahead and post post the Braille uh, that you had just typed. So I'll give I'll give another example of this in action. And so as soon as I stop, it goes ahead and posts the Braille. And so the default code here is UEB. So by default, when you open Braille Blaster, you're going to be set for UEB contracted Braille. If you want to change that, if you want to use a different code, you do that by going to settings, translation settings. So you go to the menu, you go to settings, you go to translation settings. And then that's going to bring up the settings dialog on the translation settings tab. And there's only one option on this, this whole, this part of the dialog, and that is your Braille standard. So you've got UEB and it's a drop down. And then you can change to UEB uncontracted. We've got Cherokee plus Nemeth. And then we've got UEB uncontracted plus Nemeth and UEB plus Nemeth. We also have Spanish US. And we want to add more support. So our goal is to eventually allow the user to add their own tables. So all of our translation tables are from Lib Louie. Uh, I don't know if folks have heard of Lib Louie. If you haven't, uh, please uh, allow me to be the person that tells you about Lib Louie. Lib Louie is this really great open source, free Braille translation uh, program that is worldwide. So it's used throughout the world. It is such a great thing to be involved with. And we've done a lot of work with them on the UEB tables. And so we want to allow folks to add their own tables. I noticed we had some folks uh, from an international audience. And so if, if English, you know, if UEB, if Spanish, US isn't what you're looking for, know that this is, you know, it's one of the things we wanna do. And I, I hope to have done this year, uh, this fiscal year at least, uh, of add, being able to add your own tables from Lib Louie. Uh, but that's something to look out for in the future. Another thing folks might not be familiar with is Nimeth. Nimeth is a, one of the math codes that we use in the United States. And so you do have the option to either use UEB, the UEB is gonna be literary and math, or you can use the UEB plus Nimeth, uh, which will be you know, UEB for literary, uh, Nimeth for math. And we're gonna co cover, um, we're gonna cover uh, math toward the end. I like to do math at the, at the end because uh, it's so exciting. Uh, you, you get through the whole thing and you get to the end and then people are getting tired and it's like, wake up folks, we're gonna talk about math. Uh, and it's Lib Louie, uh, I'll spell it on my screen here. It is L-I-B-L-O-I-S, Lib Louie. And it's typically camel capped. So capital, two capital L's. 
but yeah, I really encourage folks to get involved. It's entirely done by volunteers. Uh, so if you know Braille and you, you want to get involved in, in making LibLui better, it's totally open to you to be a part of that and help make Braille better for people throughout the world. All right. So we've typed some text. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and type one more uh, little, little line here. So this is a third line of Braille. So I've got three, three paragraphs here. You know, my, my style view says body text, my print view and my braille view match. That's something I didn't really stress enough, I think, is every line of this print view matches that same line in the braille view. I think this is a great way to work because as you're working, you can keep your focus on the print view. You know, you can be adding text, you can be using styles, you can be adding emphasis, and you can trust Braille Blaster that the two views are matching. And then when you're done, you can go back and proofread your Braille view. Um, so let's add some styles to start. So I'm gonna start with this second item. So I am typing some text right now, and I'm gonna apply the list style to this item. So we'll go to styles in the menu. We've really pared down our styles. We wanted, we had way too many styles and they were good, but you basically had to be a certified Braille transcriber with a couple of years of experience to understand what any of them were for. So that's not a good way to design a program. So we've limited our styles to just what folks really need. And so to make a list style, you go styles, lists. We've got them set up by level. So this is a one level list that we wanna make. So we go list one level. And then there's only one style available there, and that's L13. So the L stands for list, and then the one and three stand for the margins of that item. So one is, the, is where it starts, and then three is where it runs over. We'll see that better once I apply the style. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply the style now. Now we've got our L13 style, and a bunch of stuff happened there when I did that. So the kind of the number one thing was that second item, you know, it was a paragraph, you know, paragraphs in Braille start in cell three and then run over to cell one. Well, lists start in cell one and run over to cell three. They're kind of the inverse of a paragraph. Uh, so the margins changed. The style view updated. So the style view did say body text, body text, body text. Uh, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Well, now it says body text, L13, body text. The other neat thing that happened was we got these blank lines. So in the rules of Braille, uh, formats uh, 2016, um, you put a blank line before and after a list item. So we've added a list item. So Braille Blaster knows I need a blank line before this item, I need a blank line after this item. So I didn't have to think about that. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to apply the style and then uh, Braille Blaster took over from there. So what we wanna do now, let's apply a style to this third item. So this body, this third, you know, this is the third, this is a third line of Braille. Now we could go up to styles. We could go down to lists. We could go over to list one level. We could go over to L13, just like we did before, and apply that style again. But instead, what we what we can do is we can use repeat last style. So repeat last style, if you go styles, it's the very first item there. Repeat last style. The hotkey is control R. So if we use that item or the hotkey, uh, or you can find it in the toolbar, you can then apply whatever the last style you applied it'll apply it again. So in this case, it's our L13. So I applied that style to that third item, and now it is also a list item. It's, it's got that same style and everything. And then the cool thing is Braille Blaster now recognizes that we've got one list, and so it removes the blank line uh, that was appearing. Um, it removes the blank line that was appearing between the L13. 
Uh, I see somebody's having some trouble downloading uh, Braille Blaster at BrailleBlaster.org. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, I would encourage, um, I would encourage you just to follow along. And we are recording this, so you'll be able to uh, later when you're able to download Braille Blaster, uh, you'll be able to follow along with the video uh, while you work with Braille Blaster uh, later. So sorry to hear about the the issues you're having there. So. The cool thing is with Braille Blaster, you, there's a ton of rules to Braille and I don't expect everybody to know them. Uh, I know them, I, you know, APH paid me to learn them, you know? So I had a luxury that a lot of folks don't have, you know, and that APH was like, here, we're gonna pay you to learn all this stuff, uh, go do that now. So I did. Uh, with Braille Blaster, you don't have to know all of those rules. And with that uh, great power comes great responsibility. And so if you're making Braille for a student, go ahead and use Braille Blaster. Uh, you don't need to know Braille. You don't need to know the rules of Braille to use Braille Blaster and to make quality Braille for the students and the people in your life. Students are people. Uh, but there is, a, there is a piece of responsibility that goes with this. Before we get too far, I wanna make this clear. If you're making a test, so it's an exam, uh, or you're making something the student is gonna be graded on, something that really matters. If you're doing that, you need to get a, a certified Braille transcriber to make that. So if you're just making something casual, something easy, uh, some light reading, a worksheet, something daily, uh, something like that. Go ahead and make that yourself. Uh, but if you're going to grade the student on it, I really need to encourage you to get a certified Braille transcriber because uh, Braille's hard, especially when you're a young kid and you're just learning it. Um, Braille, Braille's very hard, and we don't want to make it harder uh, by having Braille errors that are there because the person making it you know, didn't know enough about Braille. Um, so that's the word of caution that I'll, I'll give there. All right, so we've got our two styles. Let's go ahead and make this is Braille Blaster a cell five heading. So cell five heading, of course, is the uh, second type of heading in uh, formats 2016 used in the United States and Canada. But if we go styles, heading two, or heading, that gives us three options. So we've got centered heading, cell five heading, cell seven heading. We want to do cell five heading. We go ahead and click it. And now we've got our cell five heading. And again, it removed a blank line. That's because in Braille, you don't want a blank line between a cell five heading and a list. And so Braille Blaster is automatically doing all this for you. It's taking care of that interaction between the styles and it's making it possible to, for you to just focus on the content and not worry as much about the Braille. Do we have any questions so far? I saw we had a question come in. Um, if you key in Braille using six key entry, is there a way to set up Braille Blaster so that as you key in Braille in the left pane, the print text, not ASCII, will display in the right pane? Um, that's not possible. The, the kind of the dream of Braille Blaster is that one day, and we'll get into six key entry, that'll probably be one of the next things we do, but we want it to where when you do six key entry, one day you'll be able to six key right into the Braille view. So you'll be able to type right into the Braille view, and then it'll back translate into the print view. Um, but the Braille view is always going to show Braille we're not gonna have the Braille view show anything other than Braille. But yeah, if there's any other questions about what we've covered so far, um, this is great, Nolan. Um, you're asking about Word documents, how faithfully does that file import into Braille Blaster? That's something we're gonna cover. Uh, and I'm actually really excited to show you all that part. It's uh, it's. It's the one part I want everyone to go home knowing how to do because it's so easy and it's such a great way to make Braille very quickly. But we'll, we'll get to that after we've covered the basics a little bit more. Um, the next thing I wanna cover uh, is emphasis and then six key entry. So emphasis works just like you'd expect it. 
it used to not work like you'd expect it. And I'm so proud that we've got it working the way folks expect it to work. So if I want to type some bold text, I've got my cursor at the end of my document where I've got, this is a third line of Braille. And I'm just gonna hit space. And I wanna put some bold text. All I have to do is the hotkey for bold, or I can go emphasis in the menu, bold, or I can go through the toolbar, bold. I'm gonna use the hotkey, which is control B. So I've done it, I've pressed control B, and now I'm gonna type, this is some bold text. So just like that, I'm now typing bold text, just like you'd expect. I know that doesn't seem like much, but it used to behave differently. And so I'm so proud that I'm able to say, this works just like it does in Word or anything else. And I can then do control B to turn it off. Uh, this is not bold text. And I can do the same with italics, you know, control I, or I can go emphasis italics. This is some italics. And again, control I to turn it off. And so that's how you do emphasis. Very easy to use, very easy to learn. Uh, you can, you know, do control B and then control I for this is both, um, both italics and bold. Um, got a question, how accessible is Braille Blaster with JAWS and NVDA? Uh, Braille Blaster is accessible with both JAWS and NVDA. The best way to use Braille Blaster, I will say, is with a Braille display. So if you are uh, a blind user, I would suggest using a Braille display. That way you can read the Braille as it appears. JAWS and NVDA both have uh, their own ways of handling Braille in the Braille view. And so I would recommend having a Braille display. Our, our development team is primarily uh, people that are blind. And it's funny because we've actually had a few accessibility issues that have come up where we've made things that weren't accessible to uh, sighted people. I'm really, it's sort of, I'm sort of proud so, so much that uh, it's so often that people that are blind deal with software that's not accessible. And it's very rare that people that are blind make software that's not accessible to people with sight but they made some things that, that didn't play well with a mouse, um, but we, we fixed those, but it's still just a funny thing that happened. Um, the other thing is uncontracted and direct translation. Uncontracted, I think folks are gonna know what I'm talking about there. So if I go tools, change translation, I've got two options. I've got direct translation and I've got uncontracted. So uncontracted, I think folks know what I mean there. It means get rid of the contractions. So I'm gonna highlight Braille Blaster. Braille Blaster's got a couple trans uh, con contractions in it. So I'm gonna highlight Braille Blaster. I'm gonna go tools, change translation, uncontracted. And then that's gonna uncontract just the word Braille Blaster. And so you can use that selectively when you need, um, um, just one word or a section to appear uncontracted. If you want your whole document to appear uncontracted, I would not recommend just highlighting and then using uncontracted. I would recommend changing your translation table like we talked about earlier. So settings, translation settings. Yes, uh, using the uncontracted is great for uh, spelling books. Uh, so I think folks uh, can really take advantage of that. So type out the word, type it out again, and then um, apply uncontracted to that second instance. And then that way the student can see that same word, both contracted and uncontracted. And you can just do your whole spelling list that way. Now, direct translation isn't gonna be as clear. Um, direct translation, that's just a term that we made. I think I'm still, yeah, bold in italics. Um, so that's just a term we made to mean uh, Braille without, you know, ASCII Braille is what, we, is what we're doing. So um, I don't know how many folks know ASCII Braille. It's not the easiest thing to know. You've probably encountered it. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn it on so folks can uh, see it. So if I go view, view Braille, and then turn off my Braille view, and then turns off the Braille font, this is ASCII Braille. 
over here on the right. So, you know, all the contractions, the letters are just letters, but then the contractions uh, and then the other stuff, like the capital indicators, that's just going to be like the capital indicator, a dot six is a, is a comma. So that's ASCII Braille. So direct translation lets you type, I turned my Braille back on, view, view Braille, uh, lets you type in ASCII, and then you can, it'll then translate. So it's not going to be useful all the time, but sometimes you do want to force a translation. And so you might prefer to do that using ASCII Braille rather than uh, six keying it for whatever reason. Some keyboards don't uh, don't accept six key entry. They only allow you to press so many keys at a time. So that's another issue that can happen. But here's an example. So I'll make like an old school Braille arrow. So that is a uh, dollar sign three, three, oh. So uh, I'll go ahead and, uh, well, it's translated there. And so it just translates as what it is. So you get the translation for dollar sign. So dot four S you get the number sign and then you get the three, the three, which is actually C. So that's C, C and then O. Well, if I, if I highlight that and go tools, change translation direct, that's gonna direct translate it. And so now I'm getting the ED symbol for the dollar sign and I'm getting the lower threes for the number threes. And then the O is still just an O. So direct translation is a way to get ASCII uh, Braille. Now, what might be easier than uh, six keying or than uh, direct translation is six keying. So let me make sure I've got my uh, direct translation direct translations turned off. And so now I wanna to go to six key mode. So I go to tools and then the third item down there is six key mode. The hot key is alt plus X. So I'll go ahead and activate that through the menu. And now when six key mode is active, the only keys on your keyboard that you can type with are S, D, F and J, K, L and then the space bar. So the space bar will make spaces and then SDF JKL uh, will make uh, braille. So if you press all of them, you know, you get a full braille cell. You know, if you press just SDF, you get, you know, dots one, two, three, JKL, four, five, six. And then, you know, you're free to type uh, whatever it is you would like. So I'll go ahead and type braille blaster. I uh, read Braille a lot faster than I type Braille, <laughs> but there I've typed Braille Blaster exclamation mark. And so would be lovely to have tools to help proofread the accuracy of six key entry. And that's something that we've got on our list. We have a very long list, uh, which you may notice as we proceed today, but we've always wanted to make, um, in, in addition to a better spell check, we've wanted to make a Braille check and that will find common Braille errors and mistakes as you're six keying. So you're absolutely right about that. And we do still, we need to update our emphasis tools. They will, so if I, if you continue emphasis from, oh, I'm still in six key mode. If you continue your emphasis, so I'll do control B, this is bold or still italics. Uh, there are rules about how that works in Braille. And so it shouldn't, when you continue an item's emphasis, it shouldn't put this end indicator here. And that's something we need to address. Uh, part of why it's been a problem for us is the way LibLouis uh, does translation. It only sees things one chunk at a time. So it sees one list item. It doesn't see two list items. Um, but one of the things is uh, folks that do Braille know you typically don't have that much emphasis. Emphasis is more distracting than it is helpful. So transcribers tend to remove emphasis uh, more than, uh, than add it. So we also have a question, is there a spell check? We, we used to have spell check, but it is currently disabled because what we had wasn't good enough. It wasn't really helping anybody. So 
we're looking, if anybody knows an open source spell check that we can plug in, uh, we are looking to uh, get an improved uh, spell check that we can use. All right. Were there any questions uh, about this before we jump into the style options, which is going to answer our question about double line spacing? What is the best way to make a track line six key mode? Yes, I would say your best way to make a track line would be to use six key mode. And then I would set your margins uh, for, uh, we have these numeric margins and I would set them for one, one. And then that way every line is gonna start in the left and then run over to uh, you know the first cell. So it'll start on the first cell and it'll run over to the first cell. And then that way you can type uh, multiple track lines in the same document and then give them to the student. Um, is there a way to add contractions? Uh, the student already knows. Uh, so this is a question we get all the time as well. And it's one of, uh, one of our number one features that we wanna do is a contraction suppressor that does not exist at this time, uh, but it's something we definitely wanna do and we know folks want to be able to do that. You can sort of do it with find and replace, and I'm not going to get into it today because it's it can get complicated, but you can use find and replace to look for, uh, say, the word the, and then uncontract it. So we're not going to have time, I think, to get to find and replace today, uh, but that is one way you could do it. It's, uh, it's pretty manual, and I know it's not ideal, but it's something you could do in the meantime. Your other option, of course, is to six key. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of folks, I've talked to a lot of folks <laughs> over the years presenting Braille Blaster, and there's a lot of folks that when they make Braille, they are almost exclusively doing six key. And so with our new six key, you are totally free to now do that with Braille Blaster. So if you wanted to, you could six key your document, and then it's really easy to suppress contractions uh, that way. All right. So we had a question about double line spacing. Oh, uh, if I wanna create generic BRF files for later embossing from another location, which device can I choose in settings that will work even if I don't have an embosser connected to the machine on which I'm creating the files? You've asked a good question there and I should cover that before we jump into style options. So we've made some Braille, okay? We've got our Braille. What are we gonna do with it? So let's let's jump into what you can do with this Braille before we start to get any more complicated. So go to File, and then you can go Save or Save As, and then that's gonna let you save that file. So let's go ahead and save it. So we'll go Save. I'm gonna go ahead and put it on my desktop. Uh, I'll just call it uh, Test Braille. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna save it as a BBZ file. That is the Braille Blaster file type. So it stands for Braille Blaster Zip. So I'm gonna go ahead and save it. And so if you save that, um, you can now emboss. So you can emboss from this file directly. You don't need a BRF to emboss from this file. You can just go file, emboss. And we'll get into embossing in just a moment. Uh, if you've got a friend that you need to send the file to, you can send it to them. And if they're really cool, like you are, and they use Braille Blaster, because they're hip and they're on the cutting edge of things, um, then they can open that BBZ file and then they can emboss directly from that. Uh, however, if you've got a friend that's not cool uh, and isn't on the cutting edge and doesn't use Braille Blaster, you can go ahead and save a BRF. So you can go file, and then it's right there under save as, save BRF slash PEF. And by default, the first option is gonna be BRF. And if you've already saved the file, it'll already have the file name ready to go. So it's already got test braille.brf ready to go. So I can go ahead and save it. If you wanna save it as a PEF file, that is a, it's portable embosser format. It's, uh, it's used more in Europe than it is in the United States but you're also free to save it as a PEF file and you can send it to your friend that maybe needs a PEF file. 
but yeah so save it as a brf and then you can send it to your friend um if you want to look at your file can you open your bbz once just saved having some trouble opening i'm not sure why you would have issues opening your bbz file but should be able to just open them and then be able to view them if you're having issues um you know, contact us at customer service and share the big thing. The biggest thing you could do there is share the BBZ file that you can't open with us uh, because then we can examine it and see what maybe happened. All right. So that's opening files and saving files. And we'll get into embossing later. I don't want to get into embossing right now. Let's keep keep working with this basic file that we've saved. And then the first thing we want to look at are style options. So if you go to style options, you've got a few different options that you can apply. The very first one is line spacing. And this is, I think, going to be the most useful to folks. So you go styles, options, line spacing, and then your options are one or two. The default is one. Uh, so if you want to do double spacing, select two. And then that's going to double space your document, and so then you'll be able to um, then you'll be able to uh, emboss from there. Uh, so you can emboss this as a double space document. Um, if you need to change it back, you just highlight the same selection, and you go styles, options, line spacing, and then change it to one, and then it 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 shows you know again. Another thing here is my favorite hotkey is uh, undo, control Z. So you can press control Z, and then that will undo whatever it is you just did if you decide you don't like it. And you can always do control Y, which is redo, to redo whatever it is. These are also up in here in the toolbar, undo and redo. And they're also in the edit menu, undo and redo. But yeah, so double line spacing, styles, options, line spacing and then you've got one and two the others are also useful they're going to be more useful i think to transcribers you know working on like advanced documents but we'll go ahead and cover them um the first one is don't split so don't split does just what it says which it will not split an item so if you've got multiple pages and you go don't split true that will mean like a paragraph. Let's say you've got a five line paragraph that's going to be split on two pages. Just turn on don't split, and then that will cause it to not be split. And it will then only appear on that second Braille page. Keep with next is similar. Uh, keep with next, when you apply that to an item, it will cause that item to keep with the next item. So like if I apply it to, is it still on? Then is it still on will stick with, keep with this line that says Braille Blaster. So if Braille Blaster goes to a new page, is it still on will follow it and also go to a new page. Um, skip number lines is gonna skip the top line, the bottom line, both or none. So this is this is kind of an advanced tool, and then guide words is also an advanced tool. Um, and guide words we're probably going to remove because we no longer do all this extra work with guide words. So those are the style options. I think the most important one there is going to be double line spacing. So styles, options, line spacing, one or two. All right. Are there any questions about what we've covered? And while we're talking about that, and while questions are coming in, I'm going to jump into file opening because I'm noticing some questions about file opening. Um, so if you go file open, that will allow you to open open files, obviously. And Braille Blaster opens a lot of file types. So primarily, you're going to be opening uh, BBZs. So, you know, you save it as a BBZ, you open it as a BBZ. And when you open it, it's going to open just like it closed when you had it. So you'll be able to edit it, you'll be able to update it, you'll be able to emboss it, you'll be able to save it again, whatever it is you need to do. Um, but we also open HTML files, 
uh, we open a lot of variations on HTML files. So HTM, HTML, XHTML, lots of variation there. Uh, we open doc and docx files. So that's Word files. And we're going to go over that here in a moment. Uh, we also open BRL files, text files, and ODT files. ODT is open office. So if you don't have Microsoft Word, you can get this program called Open Office, and it is a free version of Word and Excel and PowerPoint. And I encourage, you know, I like free, Braille Blaster is free. So get Open Office, and you can create files with it and then open those in Braille Blaster. Um, now, here's the thing though if you open a BRF, oh, and we also open EPUB files. Um, if you open a BRF, you can't edit a BRF at the moment. So let's go ahead and open this BRF that we made earlier. So I've opened the BRF. Notice it didn't open in the print view, in the Braille view. It opens in this separate view called the Braille preview. Um, and in the Braille preview, you can view the Braille if you've got multiple pages, you know, you can check it out and it opens it up like a Braille book. So you've got your, you know, your, your top page on the right, your back page on the left. And so it gives you an idea of how that book is going to look when the Braille reader is using it. You can emboss from here. So you can go file emboss and, you know, you can change the view and we've got a few other options for searching and navigating in the file. But that is one thing, you can't edit a BRF. And the reason you can't edit a BRF is because we've developed a program called Braille Zephyr and Braille Zephyr is a BRF editor. It was made by a developer at APH named Mike Gray. And Braille Zephyr is a BRF editor. And we felt because Braille Zephyr existed, there was no need to add BRF editing into Braille Blaster. And so that's why you can't edit a BRF uh, because Braille, Braille Zephyr exists. But you can't open them and emboss them. If you're having issues with compatibility on BBZ files, you wanna check that the person has the latest update. I definitely think there's an issue where maybe somebody hasn't updated because the really old versions of Braille Blaster um, aren't gonna open the, the newer file type. Uh, we've also got lower left corner of screen, print page, Braille page. So we're talking about the status bar. Uh, I love this feature, but can never use it because I can't see any numbers after the print page and Braille boxes. Can you make these longer? Yes. No, that's good. That's a good, that's really great feedback. Uh, I could see why someone would want those to be larger. So yeah, uh, I'll make a note of that. And that's something that we will, uh, we will work on uh, in a future uh, update. Thank you. So I'm making a note to myself. All right. How is EPUB support at this time? EPUB support is good. We do have, uh, there's work that needs to be done on tables and we have an issue with indexing. But if you open an EPUB in Braille Blaster and then edit it, uh, you'll be able to edit it as well as, as anything you need to. And you're still gonna be done faster than if you, if you hadn't opened it in Braille Blaster. I know you may cover this later, but if you format a document using Blaster and then send that text to Word, assuming you can do that, will it maintain format integrity? Uh, new to this product, I have a Mantis and love that product. I'm glad you like your Mantis. Um, so if you edit a file in Braille Blaster, only Braille Blaster can open that file, unless it's a BRF. If you make a BRF with Braille Blaster or a PEF, you can then open that in anything that can support those. But as far as BBZ, it's a one-way trip from Word to Braille Blaster. So you won't be able to go from Braille Blaster back to Word, um, but we'll cover Word support here in just a moment. Let's jump into Word actually, because I wanna make sure this is the really the most important thing. And the thing I absolutely want everyone here to know about. Um, and I wanna make sure we cover it. So let's talk about Word support. I'm gonna go ahead and open up Microsoft Word and then 
So I'm going to pull it over and we'll go open, browse, um, sorry, test files, pandoc, docx, analyzing the text. So I've got a file here. And this is a file that was made in Microsoft Word. And anybody here can make this same file. This is all using the default styles of Word. So I've got my draft view configured to show you the styles. And most that is not the default. So if you're looking in draft view, you're not going to see the styles. Uh, just search for C styles in draft view if this is something you want to be able to do. Uh, but the point is, it's just you can just apply the styles in Word. So the first thing, analyzing the text, heading one. You just type analyzing the text, you apply heading one. Paragraph, that's just the normal style. Bold, that's just highlighting and using bold. None of this is special. None of this is, is out of the ordinary. Highlighting these numbered items. So you highlight those numbered items and you use the numbered list option in Microsoft Word. And then that's going to apply the list style. Uh, this next thing here, performance task, that's heading two. So we've got performance task. We've applied a heading two to it. And now we're, we're good to go. Writing activity, that's a heading three. You know, again, this is just the default normal. These are the regular styles inside Word. Nothing special. You don't need anything extra. You're just using Word, you're applying headings, you're applying list styles, you're applying emphasis, you're typing text, and then you just save it, you know, save it as a docx, and then you go back to Braille Blaster, and then you go file, I think I, you know, file open, and then I have to go back, test files, pandoc, docx, analyzing the text. And then there are issues in the current release with this, so your, your behavior is going to be slightly different from mine. We have, uh, I'm using the test build. And so we've got, I've got an update and it's going to be coming to you all probably next week. Um, but notice how this file has been updated. So that heading one, that he heading one became a centered heading. So there's my analyzing the text. My paragraph became a body text. My bold came over. I've got my list, it comes over as an L13. I've got my bold that came over. And then I've got my uh, performance task. There's my heading two, now a cell five heading. I've got writing activity. That was my uh, heading three, now it's a cell seven. And then I've got my paragraphs. Uh, Braille Blaster, of course, I didn't cover this earlier, but Braille Blaster, of course, does automatic Braille page numbering. So we've got our automatic Braille page numbering. You know, so anybody can do this, anybody. So if you need to make a worksheet, if you need to make something like that, uh, you know, some type of casual reading, a great, great, great way to do that is to start in Word, use those styles, use the headings, use the paragraphs, use the list styles. You know, I could have done a bulleted list. I could have done a nested list and then save it, come back to Braille Blaster and then open it up in Braille Blaster and you're done. You don't really need to do anything to this file. Uh, you know, you can go ahead and emboss it. You can send it, you can send it out, you know, send the file to somebody. You can open it up on your Mantis, uh, whatever it might be. How do you add the print page numbers to line up with the doc? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you for that, Dakota. Um, so let's talk about print page numbers. So are there any questions about word support before we get into print page numbers. Because now that I've got a, a decent sized document to work with, it's a good time to show you all how to do print page numbers. But I wanna make sure we're not leaving anybody behind. All right. So if I create a table of contents in Word, does it port over? Um, yes, it's not gonna port over as a table of contents but it will port over as a list. Uh, we no longer have the table of contents builder. Um, so we're not able to do an automatic table of contents for you, um, but you should be fine uh, there. Do the Bookshare docs play nice with BB? Uh, that's a good question. 
and something I need to check out. So thank you for bringing that up. I have a Bookshare account that I'm allowed to use for testing purposes. So I'll, I'll try that out and download a file and open it and see, see how it looks. How about tables in Word? Yes, so tables are supported in Word and should open fine as either a spatial or a listed table. What Braille Blaster will do is if it'll fit, it'll open it as a spatial table. And if it's too big, it'll open it as a listed table. We do have a couple issues with tables right now. So I don't wanna get into tables because I'm worried it'll confuse folks, but we are working uh, to address those and uh, you, will, you will be able to open them just fine. Ah, good question, David. What if you just copy in a Microsoft Word file? You will not want to do that. So if you copy and paste text from another source, you'll be able to copy it, but what you paste is just gonna be the text. We're not able to pull, it's called the clipboard, and we're not able to pull that style information from the clipboard. So if you want the best formatting, you wanna save the file, and then open it in Braille Blaster. So yeah, good question. I'm glad you asked that so I could clarify. All right, let's do page numbers now because page numbers have changed. I think they've changed for the better. Page numbers were one of the most complicated things in version one. I wasn't happy with page numbers. Users weren't happy with page numbers. I, I you know, my old job was as a QA, as a tester. And I've probably made 150 tickets about page numbers. So many tickets about page numbers. Um, and if, if um, the page numbers now are through the edit menu. So you go put my cursor. So I, I wanna put a page number at the very top of the page. And so I'm gonna go edit, edit print page numbers. And then right there, the first option is insert page number. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert a page number. And that's just gonna put in my page number. And it's gonna start at one. So it's gonna start at one. And then let's, let's put in a second page number. So I'm gonna put my cursor here in front of, sorry, my Teams chat is, is probably showing up on the screen. Sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna put my cursor here in front of the three and I'm gonna press F4 which is the hotkey to insert a print page number. And then that's gonna insert a print page number right there where my cursor is. So notice it's now two, so it's gonna increment. So you insert the first one, that's gonna be one. You insert the next one, that's gonna be two. Uh, you can probably guess what happens if I insert a third one or a fourth one. So as I'm inserting these, it's, it's, it's putting in the, the, the new print page number, it's putting in the line. This is so much better if I, you know, I think that's safe to say than the way it worked in V1. I'm not even gonna cover how it worked in V1. It's not worth wasting your time over, but it is, this is the new method and there's a number of things you can do. And so I'll cover the different things you can do. So edit print page numbers. So the second option there is change page number. So if I highlight the two and go change page number, it opens up this little menu uh, and then I can put, uh, you know, I can make this six. I'll just make it six, hit okay. And now that changes that page number to six. And next I've got delete page number. So if I wanna remove a page number, so let's say I wanna remove this six. So I'll go ahead and go edit page numbers, delete page number. Now it's removed it, it's gone. Now we've got set page counter. So remember when we put in our first page number, it put it in as print page number one. Um, not every book starts at print page number one. Not every uh, file needs to start at print page number one. Uh, so if you need to start at a different point, you can go edit print page numbers, set page counter. And then, you know, right now it's set for four. Let's set it for two. So we set it for two. Now, when we insert a page number, it's gonna make it a two. And so just like that, we're able to set our print page number count. 
reset page counter, it does the same thing as set page counter, except it just puts it at one. So it'll just jump you right back to one. Um, another cool thing we've got here, are remove all page numbers. That does exactly what you think it does. You know, if I were to click this, it'll get rid of every page number that's here. And then the other option is renumber page numbers, which is um, fun to say, if nothing else. But to give you an example of that, let's change that two back into a six. So I'll go edit, edit print page numbers, change page number. And I'm going to change that two into a six. And so now we've got our six. And so it does, you know, our count is off. We've got six, we've got three, we've got four. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So what I can do is I can go edit, print page numbers, renumber, and then it renumbers from that point. So now the one, seven, eight. So now it's picked up the count from that point. So we've still got more we wanna do with print page numbers to make it easier, but I think already we're like leagues ahead of where we were before. Uh, that's how you edit print page numbers. Um, were there any questions about that? So I know that's a big topic and I know there's a lot there uh, that we just covered. And if you open a supporting file type like a NIMAS file that has print page numbers in it, those should automatically import. So you shouldn't have to mess with adding them manually. This is just for file types where it's not supported like Word files or uh, EPUB files typically don't have print page numbers, for example. So are there any other questions before we jump into math? I want to, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here today, and I want to make sure we're able to cover math. So we got a question about workflow coming. Looking forward to that. I'm going to go ahead and close this file out. If I, if I have a Mantis, do I first export the file to BRF, then put it into Mantis? Yes. Um, you're going to want to, yeah, the Mantis can't open BBZ files. So you're going to want to save it as a BRF or a PEF, and then you can open that on the Mantis and read it. Um, one of the things we want to add to the Mantis in the future is a BRF editor. Uh, but for now, if you want to edit it on the Mantis, there are, um, there are um, limitations on how large a BRF can be when you want to edit it, because we have to back translate it um, on uh, the Mantis. Is there a reference sheet for hotkey shortcuts for Mac users? Uh, no, and that's something we need to do. So I'll, I'll put that on our list of things to do um, to have a, a reference sheet for Mac users. We did a survey and uh, like 90% of our users are on Windows, uh, as you might imagine. So we've put a lot of our resources into the Windows version, uh, but you're right that it wouldn't hurt to have a, a Mac, a list of Mac uh, reference sheets. Um, thank you, Nicole. Uh, we've got a reminder here. Uh, please talk a little about embossing. Uh, so yes, let's talk about embossing. I'm glad it was mentioned because I was gonna skip right over it. Uh, but what's the point of all this Braille if nobody can read it? So file, emboss. We got two options here. Let me clear something up first. File print. File print is going to print the print view, if I can say the word print more. Uh, so if you go file, print, that's going to print this print view. It is not going to print the Braille. I know transcribers and some teachers want to be able to print um, to be able to print the Braille view, but you're not going to be able to um, right now. It's something we want to do, but you can't do it right now. It's, it's more complicated than it sounds, uh, but it's on our list. So emboss, the other option here is emboss. So if I go file, emboss, I've reset back to the defaults. So the first time you go file emboss, it's going to say, create embosser profile. An embosser profile needs to be configured to emboss. Would you like to create one now? And I'm gonna say yes. And then this is, it brings up the emboss dialog and we now need to set up our embosser. Um, and so I wanna set up 
I'm going to set up the Pix Blaster embosser, which is one of our APH embossers. So I'm going to type in the name Pix Blaster, and then I've got my list of uh, devices. And I'm going to go ahead and pick APH Pix Blaster. And then I need to set up the manufacturer. So that's going to be APH. And then the model, which is going to be Pix Blaster. And then I just click OK. And just like that, I'm ready to emboss. So I covered that really quickly, but let's jump into it. So I've made my embosser. I can edit it. I can remove it if for some reason I no longer have that embosser. And I can add a new one. So let's add a new one. So I'll call this one Page Blaster. And then you know I would pick it from the list. The, the list of manufacturers is pretty long. And so you'll want to know who does the product support the Juliet. Yes. So I'm trying to remember who makes the Juliet. Uh, there's so many of, I think it's enabling. Yeah. So yeah. So you'd pick enabling technologies, and then you'd pick the Juliet 120. Now here's the thing. Let's say you've got a Romeo. Uh, now let's say you've got a Romeo Pro 50. Make sure you pick Romeo Pro 50. We've also got Romeo 25, and we've got Romeo 60. We've got Juliet Pro 60. We've got Juliet Pro, Juliet Classic, Juliet 120. Make sure you pick the exact same embosser as the one you're trying to emboss to. Uh, even if the name is similar, if it's not the same one, you're going to run into issues. Uh, something we've learned in our embosser support is there are a ton of embossers, and there's a they all are different. They're all different. So pick the exact embosser. If you have an issue with your embosser, if it's not working, please, you know, we test these, but we have a limited number of embossers that we're able to test with. So if you've tried this and it didn't work, email customer service, tell them what version of Braille Blaster you were using. You want to make sure you're using the latest version. Tell us what embosser you were trying to use and then tell us how you had it set up. So what manufacturer and what model you were using. And then tell us what happened. Either it didn't work or it, sometimes you know there's little things that'll happen like it embossed an extra character at the top that I wasn't expecting or whatever it is, tell us about it. And then we will get it fixed. We can't fix it unless you tell us. So send that to customer service, make sure you include all that information. They'll get it to the development team and we'll get it fixed. Now, if your embosser isn't listed, so you've got an old embosser, these things last forever. So you've got an old embosser. It's not one of the ones we have listed. What you want to use is the generic manufacturer. And then your options are text only and text with margins. We also have a graphics embosser option. That Don't worry about that. That's a test uh, that we've got there. Uh, we are working to improve graphics embossing support. But for now, text only and text with margins. Text only is uh, loose sheet paper. And text with margins is um, when you have, uh, I can't think of the word suddenly, um, tractor fed paper, when you have tractor fed paper. So most folks I think are going to be tractor fed. So you're going to want to go generic text with margins. And then try that. And that should work with just about any embosser. It's going to give you just the most basic level of support. That's another thing, too. If you write into customer service, hey, I tried my Juliet 120. I had an issue. Here's the issue. I tried generic text with margins, um, and that worked. But I had this issue with when I tried that. Tell us all that. And that really, 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 really helps us narrow down uh, what we need to do to make your embosser work. Um, so th thanks for bringing up embossing. I'm so glad you mentioned it because I, uh, I, I wasn't thinking about it. It was on my list to cover, but I skipped right over it. All right. So that's embossing. We've only got about 10 minutes left. Uh, let's jump into math because I'm worried we're going to run out of time if we don't talk about math. So math support in Braille Blaster is not, is not that complicated. Um, if, if you're doing something simple, if you're doing something where the keys are on the keyboard, it's really easy. So one plus one, 
that's super easy because all those keys are on the keyboard. You've got a one key, you've got a plus key. It's all right there. Um, where you run into problems are when you want to do something where there is not an equivalent key on the keyboard. So you've got two times two, something like that. You've got X squared, something like that. There's no times key on the keyboard. There's no X squared key on the keyboard. So to make those kinds of math problems, we use something called ASCII math. And so what ASCII math does is it takes um, math and turns it into uh, keys you have on your keyboard. That's really what the word ASCII means. It, mean, it, it means something different, but it basically means the keys on your keyboard. So here's an example. To make two times two in ASCII math, you can just, I'll, I'll go ahead and type it first as plain text. So two times two. And then that gets translated as two, well, two asterisk two. So I get two, and then it translates as an asterisk, and then I get the two. So if I want to make it math, I've got to tell Braille Blaster that it's math. So I got to go, I got to highlight it. I got to go math. I got to go math translation toggle. The hot key is control M. So I do use my hot key. And now I've got two times two and it's translating into UEB math. And the other cool thing is now that I'm in math mode, everything I type is gonna be in math. So if I wanna make an exponent, let's say I wanna make X squared. So X caret two, that's how you make X squared in Braille Blaster using ASCII math. Um, there's all sorts of things I could make and it can seem, um, it can seem like a lot, but the cool thing is all of these are available in the spatial math editor. So if you go math, spatial math editor, or excuse me, uh, I'm getting myself confused. Math, ASCII math hub. So math and then ASCII math hub. And then that is gonna open up the math hub. And then the math hub contains everything you'd ever need to know uh, how to make using ASCII math. So whatever you need to make, it's here. So let's say you wanna make um, the square root. The square root of something isn't that obvious. So, you know, you select it. We've got a list of examples. These are accessible, they're all labeled. So they'll be available to your screen reader. You know, we've got fractions, we've got long equations, we've got square roots, we've got all sorts of things here. But I've selected square root. And then over here on the right, uh, we've got a couple things going on. Number one, we've got our ASCII math down here in the bottom. And the ASCII math for that is SQRT, curly bracket, 64, close curly bracket. So it's the square root of 64. Above that is an image. Now this isn't just any image. This is, uh, it's made with what's called MathJax. And MathJax is accessible. So if you're using a screen reader, you're gonna be able to, to read that with your screen reader. So even though it's an image, you still will be able to read it. Now, the cool thing is, is I've, I've selected this example and now I can edit it. So we, like we've got the question, uh, how do you type the multiplication cross? So we'd have to go into our operation symbols and one of them is multiplication cross, yeah. There's the multiplication cross. So I'll do two, multiplication cross, two. And there it is, or that's the, excuse me. Yeah, that's the multiplication dot. And then the cross is right next to it. And then that is asterisk two. So that's how you would do two times two using the multiplication cross. Do you have any tutorials for using math in Braille Blaster? Yes, we have two uh, short videos. They're both about five minutes. One is about um, ASCII math, which is what we're talking about now. And then the other one is talking about spatial math. So this is ASCII math. Everything you could ever need is here in this math hub. So play around with it. It's got a search function and you should be able to use it from there. 
And then the other thing we've got is spatial math. And we are, we're quickly running out of time. Um, but I want to show you all spatial math very quickly. So when you go math, spatial math editor, that opens up the spatial math editor. And here you can make math templates, which is going to be like simple uh, uh, vertically arranged uh, math equations, and then number lines, and then matrices. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a uh, number line before we run out of time here. So it's just text boxes. So I've gone, con I've gone uh, um, container type, number line editor, and now I've got my, my text boxes. The very first one is count by. So this is going to be the count that is set for my number line. I'm going to make it two. And then the next is the line start. So this is where your line starts. Um, so I want my line to start at negative two. And then the next is line end. And so I want it to end at four. You want to be careful here because it has to fit on the line. So it will, it will kind of snap at you. It'll say it won't fit, make it fit. So you got to make it fit and you got to make the math work out. So like I can't make the count by three and have it start at negative two and end at four. The math doesn't work out. Uh, so you know, you want to be decent at math so that you can at least make sure that the, those things happen. And then you can also add an interval. So I'm going to have my interval start at zero, and I'm going to have it end at two. And so now I've got my interval. I just go ahead and click insert. And then there you go. I've got a number line. It starts at negative two, and then it jump, you know, it's counting by two. So it goes negative two, zero, two, and then four. There's a ton of options of what you can do with the spatial math tools. Um, it's really, I think, a fun, cool tool. And it was, it was requested by TVIs. Uh, and it's very powerful. Um, I suggest getting comfortable with the basics. Just use kind of what's on the top, what's on the surface. And then as you get more comfortable with it, I think you're going to find, uh, you know, you can do just about any kind of spatial math thing you need to do. But yeah. Um, I really, really appreciate folks coming today. Uh, great questions. Um, we've actually, uh, one more question on the Mac. Is there an M1 version? We've done a lot of work on our Mac version. We now are building the Mac version on a Mac. So it is signed. It'll run on an M1. And uh, it should run great. So try it out. And thanks, everybody, for coming and asking all the great questions. If there's anything you weren't able to answer, you know, please write in to customer service, or you can go to brailleblaster.org and use our feedback uh, form. The feedback form is going gonna, is gonna to cut straight to the dev team. So please uh, communicate with us. Let us know what you like, what you love, and what you want to see more of. Getting a lot of praise, William. Thank you so much. I could only describe what you just accomplished as a masterclass webinar. Um, I was able to follow along and learned a few tricks on Braille Blaster myself. So thank you very much for the content. You did an excellent job. Awesome, um, thanks.